Hello, welcome to this latest MoLab conversation. Today we are going to talk about the seafarers. According to the International Maritime Organization, at the end of last year, 2020, there were an estimated 400,000 seafarers floating in the ocean, not being able to return home, even though they have completed their contract. Many of them have spent 9, 10, 11 months in the sea. At the same time, the equal number, 400,000 seafarers, could not go out to work by being stuck at home. And the reason for this are twofold. Number one, of course, is because of international border closure, people cannot go out or return home. Number two, the so-called crew change regulation was suspended in order to sustain the smooth flow of global supply chain. So therefore, the case of seafarers are very closely related to two themes that MoLab wish to explore. Number one is a theme on mobile livelihoods. Seafarers, of course, they work through the form of mobility. So mobility is a form of work and labor and a source of livelihood. The second theme that we wish to discuss through the case of seafarer is linked and distributed mobilities. As we can see, seafarer mobility is not anything free-flowing mobility. The mobility is very strictly structured and also their mobility is closely related to mobility of goods, the ship, so therefore the logistical uh, industry. And also their mobilities are globally distributed in the sense that it's a particular type of nationalities are much more likely to become seafarers than others. And their rhythm, the time, the temporal cycle of the mobility is closely regulated and also the different position, uh, seafarers who are working at a different position in the company move in a different ways. So today I'm very pleased that uh, my colleague, Max Planck colleague, uh, Louisa Pehat, uh, is joining us to talk about this case. Uh, she has been working on seafarers for a number of years. Uh, Louisa is the first uh, Max Planck Institute uh, colleagues of mine whom I interviewed in this series, so it's uh, great to have you here. Yeah, Louisa uh, is, has been working here as a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Law and Anthropology. At the same time, she is also affiliated with Martin Luther University, which is just across the road. Yeah. Louisa, welcome. Yeah. So to start uh, off, could you tell us a bit about you know, who the seafarers are? As we, we talk about seafarers, of course, they, uh, earn their livelihood through mobility, but this mobility is a structure that's conditioned by someone else, right? By including the training courses, the recruiters, and the shipping company, etc. Can you tell us about the, the, who they are and how, what type of mobility uh, they go through. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much for inviting me and having me here today. So it's a great pleasure to meet you and have a conversation uh, face to face, which yes. is quite a rare opportunity, I think, in this pandemic situation. So, uh, and I'm glad that I have the chance to talk about uh, the situation of seafarers, which I've been um, interested in and studying in my research project since um, 2019. Mm. Um, so, who are seafarers? So, there are two million seafarers, approximately. Mm -hmm. And as you see it at the moment, about one-fifth of them, so 400,000, are actually in huge trouble and are stuck um, on board and have trouble uh, to fly home, to uh, mm -hmm. terminate their contract and to get back to their place. So, most seafarers are coming from global south countries. Uh, in the first line is uh, the Philippines. Um, so I think um, a number of, uh, uh, of these two million seafarers are coming from the Philippines. Then comes China, I think, as a second country uh -huh. of origins. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then is uh, according to the latest estimates when I'm not uh, when I'm not mistaken uh, comes uh, the Ukraine and then Russia mm -hmm. so these are the main uh, countries supplying um, uh, supplying seafarers for the shipping industry mm -hmm. um, and uh, of course um, there are seafarers coming from other countries as well and they are occupying usually other positions um, on board than these um, uh, seafarers coming from these four main countries they are coming, uh, so these uh, high-ranking officials, so from captains to um, uh, engineers and so on, usually they are coming from global north countries. And these are, uh, of course, ranging from, from Scandinavian countries to uh, German or French or American or the US. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but these are very small numbers. Mm -hmm. And... Um, all of these seafarers work under very different uh, contract mm. um, and uh, positions and situations. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to, to, to give a general answers mm -hmm. to what the everyday life of a seafarer looks like. But mm -hmm. I think for seafarers coming from the Global South countries, mm -hmm. they are recruited for a contract. So they are not recruited by uh, for a number of years, but they are recruited for a specific contract on board a ship. I see. And, mm -hmm. um, and this can last for a maximum of 11 months mm -hmm. under the newer uh, regulations. And um, once they are going back home, um, I think they are entitled to have one month, one additional month that uh, should be paid uh, by the company that is hiring them. Mm -hmm. um, but after that, um, that's it. So the social security wow. and the benefits are very, very um, low for the people, from the, for the seafarers coming from um, the Global South countries, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And seafarers from the Global North countries, mm -hmm. as a rule, they, are, they have permanent contracts uh, with, the, with the ship owners, and they are working on very much, much better conditions. Mm -hmm. So as part of my field work, I had the chance actually to, to check, of course, um, under anonymous conditions, but uh, anonymous uh, situations, but I, uh, I had the chance to check um, the contracts of, mm -hmm. um, of all crew members um, on a ship, on mm -hmm. container ships, so I did that in Hamburg uh, especially, mm -hmm. and I could see how much uh, people were earning as well, mm -hmm. and the differences are incredible. Mm -hmm. and so it's one to ten um, uh, differences uh, uh, for people, for seafarers working um, in the same crew on board the same ship. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even for people working in the exact same position mm -hmm. and having the exact same qualifications, mm -hmm. there are huge differences according to the countries where they are from, according to the ways they have been recruited. Oh. So the inequalities are quite, um, are quite uh, huge. So, wow. um, you know, I always think of myself working at the Max Planck Institute yeah. and thinking of having a colleague doing mm -hmm. exactly the same job than I do, mm -hmm. but like being paid um, five times more yeah. or five times less mm -hmm. than I, uh, what, I, what I make. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I would feel, it would feel really mm -hmm. disturbing. I, I would find that very disturbing, yeah. of course. So how does the seafarers themselves make sense of that? What is their explanation for this very striking a disparity in terms of pay. Is that have something to do with, I mean, structurally probably have something to do with the nature that the work is very mobile. So therefore not very standardized and they don't belong to the same company, as you said, recruited from different sources, which probably explain why the contracts are very different. But, but do the seafarers themselves develop a certain theory to say, okay, I mean, do they accept that? How, what, what, how do they think about that? Um, I think that situations are very uh, different. So mm -hmm. um, some of them are active in trade unions mm -hmm. to fight against mm -hmm. these discriminations and mm -hmm. inequalities. Mm -hmm. uh, and here I have to mention the great work of the International uh, Transportation Federation, which mm -hmm. is yeah. an incredible global trade union that is um, doing a fantastic, a fantastic work for, yes. for seafarers. So it is possible to change things, mm -hmm. or there is um, like there is some some there are some possibilities to put pressures as well mm -hmm. uh, in order to change things. But of course, most in most cases, this is not this is not uh, happening, or this mm -hmm. is going to take time before uh, it becomes possible at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think uh, one way that seafarers cope with it, or mm -hmm. uh, people working on board uh, generally, is that they are a strong reputation and um, and uh, racial um, 
uh, stigmas that are um, uh, traveling as well in the shipping industry about mm -hmm. how specific uh, seafarers from specific countries work and behave and mm -hmm. what they are good at and what they can do best and what mm -hmm. others cannot do so mm -hmm. well. Okay. So this is sort of, uh, I, I guess, one way to cope with this uh, incredible... Through racialization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so that's amazing. And then you said that, you know, they really, uh, we are talking about the low rank seafarers from the global south. So they don't sign any conventional employment contract, but they just sign one specific uh, service uh, contract. And do they keep doing that as a seafarers, or actually they work uh, after working one contract? and then they will work on something else. And uh, there's a kind of a stability despite of this uh, contractual fragmentation, or there's actually no uh, career uh, stability as they keep doing different things. Or what is the typical picture here? Um, so you have um, um, the, the least qualified seafarers. Yeah. They, they are very qualified, but they are least qualified paid. compared yeah. to, to others, yeah. and less paid, of course, yeah. than others. Uh, they are called the rankings, and they mm -hmm. can um, and seafarers are in general on board. Um, so we talk about around between ten and twenty-five or thirty people working on board these mm -hmm. gigantic uh, four hundred meters uh, ships. Mm -hmm. And so it's a very small number of people mm -hmm. working on in uh, huge um, oh. in these gigantic environments. Mm -hmm. They can be, so seafarers can be working either on deck mm -hmm. or in the engine room. So they mm -hmm. have different um, education and uh, training mm -hmm. um, uh, that they had to do, that they had to, comp to, to, go to fulfill and to do mm -hmm. in order to, uh, to, uh, to fulfill their position on board. So mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And um, yeah, um, so of course uh, it is so, uh, things work in this way that, um, that um, seafarers from, um, from developing countries from the global south generally mm -hmm. might, ha will have trouble uh, climbing up and mm -hmm. um, uh, having better paid positions mm -hmm. and um, better qualified positions mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. in uh, as, as seafarers, even mm -hmm. though they might have complied the necessary training mm -hmm. and the necessary experience on board. Mm -hmm. But typically, how long do they work as a seafarers? I mean, they sign contract for nine months and the next year they will work as seafarers again or they just change it? doing something else. I mean, we're talking about the rankings. Yeah, yeah so rankings, I think, as a rule, stay 11 months on board, mm -hmm. come back home for one month, and yeah. then go again okay, and try to find continue. a next contract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because um, financially, uh, that's how sort of uh, their, f the, the, their family life and the, well, they have like, that's what they do for a number of years mm -hmm. until, um, until they cannot uh, cope with the uh, physical requirements as mm. well of working on board a ship, which mm. is quite heavy. Because that's a very interesting. So it, on one hand, it's highly mobile. Yes. Of course, on the you know uh, the on the ship in on the ocean, they, they are uh, moving, and then the contract wise, it's always a short term, so it's constantly on contract and off contract. Yet, career wise is not mobile at all, because they're stuck at a certain position, you have a ranking, basically you're ranking, no matter how experienced you are, right? So that's probably, in a way, it seems that the physical and the contractual mobility displaced the career mobility, because every time you contract the short term, so the short term contract never add up to become a ladder through which you can climb up, right? They just repeatedly, repeatedly doing the same thing through many fragmented contracts. And that's so that on one hand, you highly hyper mobile, but on the other hand, you are, you are stuck. That's, uh, that's a very sad, but it's an it's it's interesting angle to look at how the economy is organized. So Luisa, you mentioned just now, you said about probably 10 to 20 uh, seafarers, the ranking and probably I suppose the captain and engineer or maybe even less number, probably one or two in a huge ship, right? Yes. So I'm surprised to see the, the, the relation between the volume of cargo and the number of laborers who serve the, the, the cargo. Is that all the case or do you see any uh, changing relations between uh, the movement of goods and the movement of people? In the, in the shipping industry? 
So at the moment, there are about 98,000 ocean going uh, commercial ships. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a commercial world fleet, mm -hmm. so to say, and this is increasing. Mm -hmm. And 90,000. Uh, 98,000. Oh, 98. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. 98,000. So around 98,000. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's th these are the latest estimates. And mm -hmm. And this is increasing. This number is increasing. Not surprising. Yeah, it's increasing. Yeah, because the, of supply chain and yeah, globalization. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And um, the the size of individual of each yeah of the the average size of ships mm -hmm. has been increasing as well. I see. Mm -hmm. um, incredibly in the last mm -hmm. uh, in the last year. So mm -hmm. um, I think that oil tankers. Um, are nine times nine times bigger uh, oh. than they used to be twenty years ago. Nine times bigger yeah. over nine uh, twenty years, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, container ships, it's four times bigger, mm -hmm. um, and so on. So like um, mm. the proportions mm -hmm. have changed dramatically, mm -hmm. um, and this well, yeah. Think about yeah two thousand. I mean, it was only two thousand twenty years ago. So like I think this is also quite uh, um, quite impressive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this contributes, I believe, to make uh, seafarers um, and the crew very marginal ah. on board. Um, mm -hmm. So the work, the, the workforce, um, and the human element, as it mm -hmm. is called in mm -hmm. the shipping industry, is not sort of um, um, at the core. Well, one of the top uh, priorities, I ah. think, um, mm -hmm. uh, and. Um, I believe that the technological changes uh, mm -hmm. that happened in the shipping industry contributed to make uh, mm -hmm. seafarers mm -hmm. more marginal. Yeah, mm -hmm. if you, if the the size of the crew, like if the number of people on board mm -hmm. is always smaller, the ships are always bigger. Mm -hmm. Then, well, the result is also that you know their their importance uh, mm -hmm. is sort of disappearing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there are discussions about creating. Uh, you might have heard of it. Of creating uh, or developing unmanned uh, ships, wow. which are ships without any crew on board, mm -hmm. any, any seafarers, mm -hmm. um, and um, of course part of the um, crew change crisis that you mentioned at the mm -hmm. beginning of this conversation mm -hmm. uh, has to do with that marginalization, I believe, of the um, of the seafarers uh, mm -hmm. in the shipping industry. So that mm -hmm. you know, like this issue has not taken center stage. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I must say, I'm surprised to to hear uh, this um, the trend of a marginalization of human labor in the logistical sense. Uh, the reason that I am surprised because I was thinking shipping and the logistic sectors are becoming so important for the global capitalism. Uh, therefore, I assume whoever working that kind of strategic uh, industry should have more power, but not necessarily, right? The people who work there actually now are really <laughs> overpowered by, by machine, by technology. Uh, but nevertheless, I suppose the companies, shipping companies still need people human elements of one kind or another in order to manage uh, the system, right? You to, to, to have a clear division of labor, to know who should do what, and make sure the task is completed. So now you give us a very clear trend that, that is, you know, the ships, there are more and more ships, the ships become bigger and bigger, but the human labor becomes smaller and smaller. And uh, is there any other change that come in to reconcile that, to, to increase the human intervention or technological convention to make this huge ship with a large amount of cargo uh, move in the right direction and arrive to the right port at the right time. Yeah, what I found particularly impressive is that um, while the number of uh, seafarers on board is decreasing, mm -hmm. the number of ship um, visits and ship inspections and the number of certifiers and auditors ah, mm -hmm. going on board mm -hmm. has been increasing uh, mm -hmm. dramatically as well, mm -hmm. uh, almost proportionately uh, as compared to the size of the, yeah. of the of the crew mm -hmm. uh, on, on board. And um, well, of course, um, 
as a mitigation to the hazards of these working environments, mm -hmm. which are huge, of course, like uh, the shipping industry is one of the most dangerous uh, working environments, mm -hmm. I think, in the world, as a the, the solution to say, or the, the, to mitigate the, these problems, um, uh, a number of new regulations mm. uh, entered into force uh, throughout the last decade. So that, mm -hmm. um, of course, it's supposed to help and prevent uh, dangers mm -hmm. uh, on board. Um, but this turns the work of seafarers on board into um, something very bureaucratic and um, mm. technocratic. And I mm. believe this did not exist before. Mm. Uh, so that seafarers on board also have a huge um, amount of paperwork mm. to uh, to do, mm -hmm. uh, a number of um, tables to fill, mm. a number of um, um, certificates uh, to mm -hmm. um, or uh, rules to comply with, mm -hmm. and they have to uh, prove uh, that they do that by mm. fulfilling uh, compliance forms and so on. And this is controlled then when they come to a port and uh, inspectors come on board and, and, and check whether this has been done wow. properly. That's so fascinating. Tell us a bit more. So number one, who set up all these regulations? Is it international government organization or the sovereign states or the shipping companies? Number two, who are doing all these inspec inspections, I mean, uh, you know, auditors and uh, safety officers? Is that belong to the shipping company or some the third party independent uh, consultancy type of form? And the number three is how is this uh, reinforced or enforced? Is again through state sovereign power or is it through kind of international uh, uh, coordination uh, by commercial entities? Or it's, yeah, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm just wondering to what extent commercial entity play a role and the political power play a role and certainly civil society play a role, which yeah. on one hand probably make a seafaring job more safer, but at the same time, make it more bureaucratic. Who are, the, who are behind this, this change? Well, first of all, you point, uh, you point out something very important, I think, mm -hmm. which is uh, the incredible regulation of the shipping industry. Mm -hmm. So, of course, there are illegal forms of, um, um, of commercial um, uh, uh, ships mm -hmm. that are not fulfilling these international obligations. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, um, none of the ships that we have in the global north waters, mm -hmm. so which is of course um, the main, uh, where the main uh, corridors of trade, of, um, of uh, uh, the main sea lanes are ending and so on. All of the ships we have in, in, in the global north uh, waters, they are fulfilling these obligations because they have no choice. Mm. So it's a huge um, apparatus uh, there uh, of, of uh, rules and conventions. And there are two sources of, um, of, um, of, con of regulations. Um, so these are international uh, regulations. Um, most of them are coming from the International Maritime Organization mm -hmm. based in London, mm -hmm. which is a UN uh, agency. And the second one um, the second source of regulation in the shipping industry is coming from the International Labour Organization okay. based mm. in Geneva. Mm -hmm. And I am working myself on um, the a Maritime Labour Convention um, from see. the International Labour Organization. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so there are two sorts of uh, jurisdictions uh, mm -hmm. in the shipping industry. So mm -hmm. um, the shipping industry is um, organized, is premised on a um, on the legal fiction that ships have uh, nationalities mm -hmm. um, and they are registered uh, in a particular country and mm -hmm. by registering um, uh, their ships in, in that country, um, then um, the ship owners uh, give uh, the nationality of that country uh, mm -hmm. to their ship. So this is uh, the, the jurisdiction of the flag state is mm -hmm. one source of jurisdiction um, mm -hmm. and that is very important in the shipping uh, industry. Mm -hmm. Um, and there, there have been huge changes in, uh, in the last uh, decades, of course, with mm -hmm. the emergence of what is called flags of convenience. Mm -hmm. um, so um, the main countries where ship owners are located are, I believe, um, 
China, Japan, Greece, and um, and Germany, uh, mm. um, and Singapore maybe is among mm. the five uh, the five first countries um, who supply flags. No, who supply were the sheep owners? Oh, real the genuine sheep the, owners. The, the okay. largest, um, okay. mm. yeah. Um, mm. The countries where most sheep owners are located um, mm. are these countries, but mm. their sheep are not flagged okay. um, in these countries. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this was the case until the 1970s, I believe, but this mm. changed. Mm. And uh, the most important flags um, mm. at the moment in the shipping industry um, are Panama. Mm -hmm. And this is why I'm conducting field work in mm -hmm. Panama as well. I think mm -hmm. this is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, then comes Liberia, I believe, the Marshall Islands, okay. and um, uh, these are the ones that come to my mind. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so these these uh, flag states are really an important source of jurisdiction. So actually, the laws of these states um, is um, is what counts on these ships. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a very strong jurisdiction, mm -hmm. um, but. Because these flag states did not necessarily have the means um, mm -hmm. um, or could really sort of um, enforce their own laws on board all mm -hmm. of these ships. So I think the, you know, for instance, Panama, you know, there are mm -hmm. about, I think, 5,000 ships that mm -hmm. have a Panama mm -hmm. flag. Uh, so it's, very, it's, a, it's a lot of work mm -hmm. to organize all of that. So, mm -hmm. um, and because this, um, this was not really happening in a proper way, then um, a new sort of jurisdiction appeared uh, mm -hmm. in the maybe 1980s, 1990s, mm -hmm. and this is called the port state jurisdiction. Uh, port and it's sort, of, um, it's sort of compensating the weak flag state uh, jurisdiction to some extent. So mm -hmm. like, of course, um, countries in the global south were interested that um uh, no sorry in the in the mm -hmm. global north were interested that the ships who would um sail into their waters were safe and that no oil spill uh, was going to happen mm -hmm. uh, which was the case of course um until the well they were all these major accidents um, mm -hmm. and they strengthened the controls um oh, okay. so this means that if a, port, a ship was going to sail into the port of Hamburg, let's say, uh, the German port state authorities uh, was going to go on board. So it's a ah. state port state authorities. Mm. They would go on board and check the safety of the ship. I see. So these are the two jurisdictions, the flag state and the port state jurisdiction. That's a fascinating. Yeah, uh, I would uh, refer our audience to the earlier one of the earlier episodes that we made with uh, Professor uh, Savara. Uh, more land in national uh, Australian National University. We were talking about the two methods of regulating mobility: the territorial method and the logistical method. So, territorial method is basically like a border closure and uh, border control, border policing. And the logistical method is not to close the border, not to stop mobility, but to trace the mobility itself. It seems that here also these two types of logic are working, right? The, the flag of convenience probably is more, you can, we can say it's a method of the logistical uh, mode is to facilitate the mobility. And then I'm surprised to hear this uh, a state port authorities now can uh, also impose regulations over ships, I mean, I suppose if the ship wanted to anchor at their port, right? So that kind of has a territorial uh, element in it. So therefore you mentioned the global north uh, seas, the oceans, where the ships are actually does affect how the ships should behave, right? So we talk about already the mobile workers as seafarers and the mobile regulators probably dispatched by state port authorities to inspect but is there any other third sector, like a mobile civil society uh, activists, also involved to uh, providing emergency help to seafarers or fighting for their benefits? Because this is such a global phenomenon, whether or not there's such a thing as a transnational civil society emerging in response to that. Yes, so... Um 
I think the, um, the seafarers and port, um, port workers were among the, the most unionized uh, workers mm -hmm. in the world. So they mm -hmm. are still important trade unions uh, for seafarers. Mm -hmm. The best known is the International Transport Federation, which is yeah. based in London. Mm -hmm. uh, it has um, the headquarters um, um, are in London, but they have inspectors um, working for, on their behalf um, everywhere in the world. So there are about 140 um, inspectors uh, from the trade union that is called the International oh, Transport uh, Federation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and they are doing um, they are doing an, yeah, an amazing work basically mm -hmm. that's very impressive and that's um, you know like I think there are very few global trade unions uh, that are so um, uh, successful so yeah. it is worth mentioning them yeah and um, additionally they are also important um, welfare organizations mm -hmm. in the shipping industry mm -hmm. and they are uh, usually Christian mm -hmm. so they are networks of Catholic or mm -hmm. um, Protestant um, maritime uh, missions mm -hmm. uh, devoted to seafarers. Mm -hmm. And they are originating from the global north countries mm -hmm. once more, and, but they have uh, stations um, mm -hmm. or uh, people located in, in most of the ports mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the shipping industry mm -hmm. uh, nowadays. Mm -hmm. So these are very interesting institutions as mm -hmm. well. Uh, non-political, of course, mm -hmm. but uh, trying very much to help, um, mm -hmm. like, uh, in yeah, uh, to help uh, in a direct manner, so to say, mm -hmm. uh, seafarers in need. Mm -hmm. in some kind and of I suppose they are also globally networked, and yes. uh, the activists are also highly mobile. Yeah. Right. So that's uh, again a very interesting phenomenon, and certainly it's a very has a very important uh, uh, impact on the level of mobile hoods of the seafarers. And uh, for the audience who are interested, you can also uh, visit our earlier conversation between uh, Eric Foreman and me. We were talking about why transportation workers such as seafarers have been very well organized, I mean, also including port workers. But if you look at the taxi drivers, if you look at the other type of you know, mobile workers, the transport, yeah. uh, transportation workers, they are now least unionized. Uh, so that is an interesting historical comparison can be made as well. Uh, so finally, Louisa, uh, so now the, the workers are highly mobile, regulators are highly mobile, and of course the shipping, the employers, uh, the, the, all the, the machinery, the ships are highly mobile. But the researchers now are stuck right, during the, the COVID time. So how, I mean, this is a huge challenge for all field work-based researchers, how to carry on uh, with our research during the time of mobility restrictions. But at the same time, you are interested not only in the mobility of bodies or the ship, the per se, but you are also interested in the movement of papers, right, the regulation, etc. So what can you share with us your frustrations during COVID and also whether or not you try to come up with a new method, for example, by following the paper trail or following the movement of ideas or, or uh, 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 policies as a new avenue for your research? Yeah, well, so first of all, um, <laughs> I can only share my frustration <laughs> in not being able to conduct mm. fieldwork in the way that uh, we used to conduct fieldwork as anthropologists. Um, so I think there is no best solution to this problem. So I, I hope very much that um, in the coming months, I will be able to conduct fieldwork in German ports, mm -hmm. at least, um, and hopefully very soon again uh, elsewhere. <laughs> Um, but uh, it's been an increasingly, an incredibly uh, interesting period because um, while I wasn't able to conduct field work, the shipping industry and the seafarers have become um, essential workers mm, yes. to fight the pandemic. So they are really at the forefront um, of um, maintaining and smoothing supply chains uh, internationally, of course. So they attracted quite a lot of attention and they have been, um, yeah, as you mentioned at first, uh, also leaving this um, um, dramatic uh, crew change crisis. So um, what I could do um, 
um, to compensate the lack of field work was to try, of course, to, to try to follow um, to follow these developments and to talk with the people with my informants in the field and see how they were reacting. And um, I've been also following online a number of discussions at the International Labour Organization, mm. uh, which has been um, very active as well uh, during throughout this period. Mm. So all of this is sort of um, technocratic and uh, mm. bureaucratic to some extent, but this mm. is also part of, um, this is very interesting for me to follow these developments because mm. I think they, they will impact as well the way that the shipping industry might change as well in the future. Yeah. And, um, there are lots of discussion about digitalization in the shipping industry. Um, so um, I'm interested as well to see whether in the future inspections, um, more digital inspections wow. will take place mm -hmm. on board, for instance, and mm -hmm. whether these kind of things um, will develop because, um, of course, a number of uh, inspections um, could not take place um, um, on board um, because of um, to fight the, the pandemic, of mm -hmm. course. Um, mm -hmm. um, and uh, this is something that I will definitely follow uh, mm. as well in the future. Mm. Mm. That's a really point to a new research direction that we are very keen to promote as well. Namely, how a new type of infrastructure of mobility as well as infrastructure of mobility regulation is being developed. Uh, you know, as you said, the digitization of inspection. And in this process, the practice of mobility and the knowledge of mobility really form a new relation. So mobility is not something, it's just a matter of practice that unfolding naturally on the ground. Actually, mobility itself is a condition and designed, right, by regulators and the researchers, and now will be technologically facilitated and conditioned through digital information, uh, technology, and et cetera, yeah. So that will be, uh, I think it will be both intellectually and also policy-wise, very relevant for us to follow, yeah. So thank you very much, Louisa, for joining us today uh, at the MoLab conversation about mobile livelihoods and linked mobilities. Thank, thank you for watching. Thank you, too.